So the duty to protect is really a, a duty of the state to intervene in private relationships, in contexts where human rights are being threatened by private conduct, conduct by non-state actors. Um, and that duty poses specific questions in international human rights law. And the reason for this is very simple. In a free society in which individuals may in principle act as they choose, states are not in a position to prevent all violations from occurring. They must, of course, do whatever they can to prevent such events from occurring, but there are some events which they will not be in a position to, to avoid. And that, if you wish, is the price we pay for living in free societies. Um, these societies are almost, per, defi per definition, risky for individuals. Uh, only a totalitarian state would be able to prevent entirely all human rights violations from occurring, and even then, the control of the state would never be able to be complete. So this um, section of the course is about that issue. And essentially, um, we will see that there are three key limitations to what can be expected from the state. Uh, first, uh, there are resource limitations. Uh, states may not prevent any event that might lead to a violation of human rights from occurring because the resources at the disposal of the state are limited. So the state, for example, cannot post a police officer in front of um, any house uh, where people feel that they are threatened by their neighbors. Um, and that's the first important limitation. A second limitation is that um, there are other competing human rights that must be taken into account when states intervene in private relationships. Um, for example, um, the right to privacy, the right to respect for family life that may make it difficult for states to intervene within families to protect children from being abused, or freedom of association or freedom of religion may also be rights invoked um, by private actors to justify that they may exercise certain freedoms, even if this may occur at the expense of others' human rights. And the third limitation is that um, human conduct is unpredictable. There are certain events that the state will not be able to anticipate. It will be taken by surprise. And although then the state has a duty to provide remedies, to uh, prosecute, to investigate uh, events having led to human rights violations, uh, depending on their, on their gravity, um, the state may generally um, assert or, or plea that it has been um, taken by surprise by the um, human conduct um, that it could not anticipate entirely. Um, one good example of this is the Osman versus United Kingdom case of 1998 presented to the European Court of Human Rights where the Osman family was complaining that the police um, in the UK had not been reactive enough when they felt threatened by the acts of some school teacher called Budget Lewis and um, the UK could um, in that event um, argue that um, it was impossible for the police to react to all the information it received that it was not possible to arrest or um, uh, Pajelewis or put Pajelewis under surveillance because this would have meant a violation of the right to respect for, for private life or his right to, um, to liberty and security. And therefore, um, the UK could uh, argue that uh, there was no violation of the right to life, even though the father of the Osman family had been killed by Pajelewis, the behavior of the police in the UK was um, not one that uh, could be reproached and, and, to, uh, and, and was not one that could be considered to amount to a violation of the right to life. The UK was found um, in breach of another provision of the Convention in that case, but not of Article 2 of the Convention that protects um, the right to life. Now, um, one way to summarize these issues is by saying that the duty to protect is um, an obligation of means rather than an obligation of result. In other terms, the responsibility of the state shall not be engaged simply because one human right has been violated in the course of interpersonal relationships. Um, one also shall have to prove that the state can have been expected to do more, that it was reasonable to expect the state to do more, that certain measures that could have been expected from the state were not adopted when um, the state was in a position 
to, uh, to do better. So in other terms, um, what is required for the violation to be established is not simply that the human rights has been infringed, but also that um, the state has not adopted certain measures that it could reasonably have been expected to adopt. And of course, what is reasonable in particular circumstances is a matter for deliberation and, and will require to examine the range of options uh, available to the state and reasons why it had not taken certain measures that could have been expected from it. Now, in this section, we will not, of course, be able to um, uh, examine the full range of issues that arise under the duty to protect. We will focus on uh, perhaps uh, three key topics. One is uh, the, the waiver of rights. In many cases um, that concern the duty to protect, individuals have actually chosen to find themselves in particular situations or to, for example, conclude certain contractual agreements um, resulting in a, a breach of their human rights. So the question there uh, that arises is to which extent may individuals waive their human rights, uh, may they renounce the protection uh, that human rights in principle should confer upon them, and may the state invoke the fact that individuals have exercised certain freedoms to um, escape its responsibility? That's the first question we shall examine. A second question we'll examine is that of conf conflicting human rights um, or conflicts between, between human rights that um, are invoked in inter-individual relationships. For example, if um, one, um, um, one organization uh, in the name of freedom of association seeks to exclude certain members from um, the association uh, because the association wishes to preserve a particular identity. The freedom of association then may conflict with the right of individuals to join the association and to benefit from certain services provided um, as a result of this membership uh, by the organization and that um, uh, raises the issue of conflict in human rights that um, is extremely delicate and, and, and difficult um, to, um, to address for human rights bodies. And the third topic we will discuss in this section is that of transnational corporations and human rights. There's been a, a very important debate at international level in particular on what states must do to control transnational corporations and whether corporations have human rights duties that can be imposed on them, and I will uh, try to explain what the state of this debate is in 2014. Thank you.